So Capillo, first off, how are you? Doing well. Always in Zen mode. Uh, so as we always do, I want I, I I always love to start with asking you to think about the most fascinating thing that you experienced or learned this week. So I throw it to you. It's never that way. It's never it's never linear, and it's never um, something new that I. You know, it it all just kind of blends in. So it's I never I don't really think of it that way. So I wouldn't know what to say. So is, and did anything blend in particularly well this week? No, that's just a, that's just a backdoor way of asking the same question. No, nothing happened. Nothing happened at all. No. Nothing happened that made it wow. No. This an it's extraordinary just a, moment. It, no, I'm not. I'm not looking for extraordinary moments. Uh, I'm, I, I have no interest in extraordinary moments. I'm, I'm you know, I'm very much interested in in uh, uh, in an arrival and whatever the uh, whatever the rocky or calm or whatever the moments are that lead to that. That's all I'm really interested in. That's where my, where my eyes are. Well, did your eyes see anything towards that arrival this week? that uh, we haven't talked about in the past? No, you, you just won't let it go. No, <laughs> no, of course nothing. not. Don't you know nothing. me by now? Nothing. Well, well I'll, still, nothing. I'll, I'll still come back to the back. The thing, I mean, thing, things just, you know, when they arise, they arise. I don't, I don't, I don't um, think about them to talk about them. I don't, I don't, they, they come and they're gone. And usually if they come, I'll mention them in, on Twitter. So in, in honesty, um, Twitter is probably the better person to ask. Well, there's a lot of talk this week on Twitter on decision making from you. I don't really. Oh, okay. What right. did I say? You probably don't remember, but I want to get to oh. it in a minute. But I, I want to, I want to jump on a couple of things that happened to me this week that I want to get your perspective on because I know we touched on those issues briefly. But uh, I was at a conference earlier this week where I got to see a bunch of old faces and meet new friends. And as I was kind of reflecting on the way back, it was in San Diego, on the experience, I started to think about the authenticity of some of those relationships. I know you keep a very tight or a very high bar on who, who you allow in your life. How do you distinguish between a real relationship and a phony one? You know, that's a good question. I, you know... I don't really know if there are any so-called real relationships outside of the relationship that you have with yourself. And I think that all other relationships are basically um, an extension and um, a, a mirror of that one. Um, so, you know, I, what I, the things that I enjoy talking about or exploring um, really, in honesty, are the things that I enjoy exploring with clients. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, the social scene, I mean, that's very, very narrow for me. Um, you know, I don't, I don't go to parties and get-togethers unless I'm dragged there once a year or somewhere. Or somehow. I don't know how I get there, but um, but it's very tight. It's, it, it's not... Uh, and it's it's not because there are not nice people in the world. You know, there absolutely are. It's just that I, as you know, the more I go along in life, the more it becomes painfully clear that the things that I want to look into um, are not really the things that others want to look into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that's what I respect so much about you, and that's why I asked, right? Because coming back, you know, it's a couple hour drive. I was just really thinking, you know, there's a lot of people who know how to put on a face or put on an act that when they see you at one of those events or conferences, it's a hello and it's very cordial, but there's really no meaning to that relationship. And you come back and you think, you know, these kind of, these relationships, they don't nourish my life. Why the hell do I keep them? So well, I was anxious I, to well, ask I, you that. Well, I, you know, I would say that very close to zero in relationships nourish anyone's life. Um, the thing that people get from relationship is a respite from loneliness. The things that people get from relationship is a chance to, you know, laugh and discuss 
things, most of which are menial. Um, so the, if you look at the foundation of relationships, I mean, there's nothing but cracks in the foundation. So I'm not sure how many of those really there, there are. Um, uh, you know, every, every, every friendship, every relationship, not only as a friendship, but even the setting of family, I mean, you're always just a heartbeat away from disaster. Mm-hmm. Nothing in this life is is solid. You know, it's all thin ice. Why do we? Why why do most people run away from the relationship with themselves? Very few people are willing to ever talk about that. Um. Well, I mean, why why would anyone? You know, because it is. Th- in many ways, very dangerous to have those to look into that relationship with yourself because you find things that you don't really want to see, and it's far easier to ignore and deny because as soon as you verbalize something, it becomes real. So the the interiority of a human being is a very dangerous place. How do you yourself describe the relationship with yourself? Like when when you like when I threw out that whole relationship thing and you brought it up about the most important relationship, and I really agree with that, is the relationship you have with yourself. How do you describe that? Yeah, I think it really is looking into where all of your, um, sort of your emotions come from. It is where your it's in the ways in which um, a given individual is attached to all the things in his life and all the people in his life um, and how those attachments and uh, how those um, those ropes and chains that bind um, have a very costly impact upon him or her. Uh, so I think learning about those things uh, makes it clear and gives resonance and uh, and, and a, an insight into why one says, believes, thinks, feels the way that he does. Um, I think uh, I think breaking apart that foundation and tearing off all the layers uh, it, it is not something that's healthy or good for you or recommended. Um, but in doing so, that actually is the way to um, arrive at any semblance of solidity in, in one's life in which one doesn't live like a leaf in the wind. And would you say for you personally that's the most important work of your life right now? Um, it's the only work. but It doesn't really work. I mean, there's nothing else than that. There, everything else is, is simply an offshoot of that. That's the foundation. There is nothing else. And it's so, not really work. It's by necessity. Yeah, for you, right? I, I think Absolutely. the rest of the world and the rest of us need well, to really is, understand for, that. Yeah, it is for them too, but they just haven't realized it. So I'm curious, what is the correlation between some of the issues that you're called to work on with some of your best clients and their relationship with themselves. Is there always a connection? It, it's, there's no two things to connect. It's always that. Irrespective of what they're dealing with professionally. Yeah. There's, if they're dealing with it, it's them that's the issue. What does it take for somebody to see that? Because we've well, been hearing you talk about it for, at least for me personally, for a couple of years, right? And I'm nowhere near where I need to be in recognizing that. I think it depends upon where you want to go and where no, where you no longer want to be. Um, so unless there's, unless there's some impetus which creates an urgency, then you sort of... Um, you sort of, you know, sink into the collecting ground, so to speak, and and that's where the mind wanders, looking for prescriptions. 
because you don't really want it anyway, so you might as well reach out for a morsel of prescription to chew on. Um, you know, it, so it really has to be some some sense of urgency that arises uh, for one to even look in that direction. And does and it always seems like those sense of urgencies are crisis, right? If somebody's facing some difficult challenge, it's true. You know, it's true. It's true, but. Um, unfortunately, even then, once the challenge is over, then the default state returns. So, uh, one of the most life-changing things is, you know, for some people, is for instance, a near-death experience. You know, um, I think, I think, as a human being, I should have a near-death experience once a quarter, because then that keeps a person on his toes and it keeps the hunger alive for truly um, truly seeking and evaluating what's you know at, at the foundation of things so for for you does that is it a vision that you construct to start to think of life that way or you know obviously you don't no, know you know uh, uh, on no, no 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 I, I never leave it yeah, I'm at the point where I don't. I never leave it. So that's just I don't the need... space that you live. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't. I don't know why, but um, I've I've reached a point of no return. I don't need any 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 event to make me dive headlong into the interiority and the corridors of myself in order to learn about the mind. That, that's twenty four seven. It's all I do. And not, it isn't even a doing. I don't have any choice. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you try to encourage some of the people that you work with to get into that headspace? No. No, I don't encourage. That, that, that's something that has to be self-induced. Yeah, and usually those things happen by way of inspiration. They don't, they don't happen by, by way of information. One of the things that you, one of the tweets that you mentioned, one of the many tweets that I highlighted this week was this whole idea of conflicts between business partners are never solved by compromises. Yes. Help me understand that a little bit because that kind of leads to, to some of the, the business relationships that I want to get into with you. Yeah, the conflicts between not only business partners but any relationship um, if you if you compromise, what happens? It's never fifty fifty, right? Because if each person compromises, then what they have left after they have compromised is just a shell of who they are, mm -hmm. and and therefore the relationship is the king. I don't think the relationship should be the king, um, because if the relationship is the king, then that means there's no people. It's just a relationship. So. That which you compromise away, you will resent for having been forced to compromise away. So it isn't about compromise. It's about uncompromise. And, and that doesn't mean what it sounds like it means. Uncompromise does not mean that um, this is just the way that I feel and too bad. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, if there, each person has to reach their non-negotiables. Um, each person has to arrive at the, the, the thing they cannot do or cannot keep from doing. Because if they do that or keep from doing that, whatever that thing may be, then they, 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 they lose their center. They lose their foundation. They lose their essence. They lose the very thing that drives them. They lose their engine, whatever that may be. So it is about finding what the non-negotiables are. It is about finding what the uncompromisables are, um, as opposed to compromising for the sake of. That only leads to problems. That doesn't fix anything. And so when, when two people say uh, that, when each person says that, in the in the in the relationship that, the, that these are the things that I'm hard lined on because it's it, it, not for my in a superfluous way but this is truly in my DNA and I 
I can't cross that line, nor would you want me to cross it, because if I crossed it, I wouldn't be the person that you want to be in business with. Because that, that makes, that's my DNA. And when those lines are set, then what can be compromised on are the things that you hold loosely. So the things that you compromise on are the things that you don't really care about. You don't compromise on the things about who you are. Shall so we? I think these things have to be worked out. And these things have to be put on the table. And I think that when you look at things in this manner, it is a fundamentally different approach than it is to say, I'll give a little if you give a little. That doesn't go anywhere. That's empty. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate that. And I, I assume the best time to establish that is at the outset of a relationship. Uh, maybe, maybe not. I mean, at the outside of a relationship, um, you know, a person may not know what his DNA is, you know. Mm. Um, so it's whenever, you know, it's whenever the person discovers the uncompromising DNA and the lines that he is not willing to cross. That and I think that's when that conversation can be had. You know, everything has to be based upon honesty, not for moral good. I don't give two cents about moral good. Honesty, because honesty works. That's why. If honesty didn't work, I would recommend dishonesty all day and all week. But honesty works. Honesty creates something within the heart of the human being which engenders him to him. It, it allows for a solid foundation upon which to build things for, a, for anything of any lasting value to occur. And human beings are not really taught to be honest. Um, they're taught to be clever. They're taught to do X, Y, and Z. They're taught to do this and don't do that. Um, they're not really taught to be frank and forthright. Everything in, everything in society is a, a, a flinch and a beating around the bush and a don't step on that toe and don't say that too loudly. And, and it doesn't mean that you do the exact opposite because that also would be reactive. Mm -hmm. But it's about moving forward with, with honesty. How do you really feel about this? No, no one's honest with themselves. Everyone's, every, everyone's a liar. And, and as a society, we hail clever. Like anybody Absolutely. who's clever, it's like, Absolutely. wow, he's on the cover of magazines. That's right. Or she's That's on right. the cover of magazines. Yeah. Uh, um, if, if two business partners at, are at this relationship crisis mode where each thinks their, their, their contribution is disproportionate to the other, is it too late to have this uncompromising conversation? I mean, it's never too late to have the, conver uh, the conversation, no. It, it, the resentments might have built to a point where it's too late to mend them. Mm -hmm. But it's never too late to have, have the conversation, even if it is to discover that very fact. That it's just... It's too much to fix. Right. And, and do you, when you think about these non-negotiables or, or the, the key things that I'm unwilling to compromise on, do you have a general rule of how many of these things? You don't want me to make a list of 50, right? Are they the absolute essential things that I'm unwilling to compromise on? Yeah, it really is an intellectual. Uh, it's real. It's really feel and essence. Um, so it's not really a number, but it really comes down to the things that you, the things that you feel in your heart that you just can't do, or can't not do. Do you have a criteria that if you were, and I know this is not going to happen to you, but if you were to select a business partner for whatever reason, 
what criteria would you use to select this individual who could potentially be a business partner for you? You know, I am reminded of a person, Billy Bean. Yeah, if it's the Billy Bean I'm thinking about. Yeah. So there's a there's a there's a scene in that wonderful wonderful film, right? Um, in which uh, Moneyball, in which he's talking to the the stats guy that they hire. And um, and he says to him, you know, one way or another, we're going to see this through. Either we're all in or we're not. And if we're all in, then we're going to fire the entire team, right? And we're going to trade every player that we have to until we get it just the way we want because oh, it's only then that we know whether the system works or not. We can't go halfway. You know, that's the guy. That's how things get... That's that's exactly how things... That's that's exactly how the truth is learned. Mm-hmm. Right? It isn't... And it would be a mistake to assume that because he had success that that was the right thing to do. I fundamentally disagree with that. It was truth either way. The... The truth was that you had to carry out the system to a T with no exceptions, no compromises. And because it is only then that you will know for a fact whether it worked or it didn't. Because if you did it 90%, you would never be sure if that 10% was a wrench in the system or the system itself didn't work. So that that all in type sincerity is something that to me is invaluable and early on in a relationship do you just feel it you know i don't know that you necessarily you know stay with the person that you start with you know these things change so if you do and it over time it there's um there's, you know, uh, the person begins to lose his way or you don't feel that that solidness within the guy or the sincerity wanes or whatever it may be, then it may be that he had it at one time and doesn't have it anymore. So it isn't necessarily a, it doesn't have to be a long-term thing. Um, but, but, the willing, but the willingness to want to know the truth, the willingness and the true desire to, to you know, I would be partial to someone who had a um, a real objection, uh, almost a a hatred for the status quo. Who was who would be embarrassed to follow the status quo? I think that would be a very foundational element. I would look for contempt, contempt for the status quo. And, and how about this whole, the whole idea of trust, trusting somebody to dive into business with? Is there a filter that you have that you go through in your mind early on on whether or not you feel you can trust this person? Or is that even important? You know, you? You know um, trust is something that you find out over time. Uh, you will get, obviously, you will get to mistrust very quickly. If you know, if that shows its teeth, uh, but but trust establishes itself over time. Well, you had a great thread. One of the best threads this week was uh, about perf- making perfect decisions, and I want to just dive into a couple of those uh, in a second. But is there such a thing as a perfect decision? Yes. Okay, describe it for me. The perfect decision is the pure decision. The perfect decision is the per- is the decision that is that has no interference or reactivity. And is that what you mean by saying it does not produce self conflict? Correct. And and is and do you? And a perfect decision does not always produce. 
the so-called perfect result. It may produce, it, it, accord, in, in one way, a perfect decision always produces the perfect result. But the reason that I say that is, is because the perfect result in a particular human being's eyes is not always the perfect result. Well, see, that's why I bring it up, because I think you captured in about eight or nine words what countless books and articles talk about is this whole art and science or whatever of decision making. When you said that the decision is wise if it does not produce self-conflict, that doesn't mean that the decision is going to be right or it doesn't mean that the decision is going to be wrong. I look at that as being one of those uncompromising things that you talk about is, hey, as long as I feel no inner anxiety when I make a decision, whether it's right or wrong, I'm going to make it. Am I on the right track in thinking like that? Um, I, can, I, think that, I think that can be bastardized. I would say that as long as I feel nothing after having made it, mm -hmm. then it's a perfect decision. Where conscience doesn't open its mouth, and neither does fear, and neither does excitement. Where, where there's a flat line. And and because if you do it before, then you know people are clever human beings, and they'll pull out their prescription book, and they'll spend thirty minutes meditating to make themselves calm, and then <laughs> in that in that narrow fourteen second window, they'll make the decision and see see I made it while I had no anxiety, mm -hmm. and then on the fifteenth second, of course, they become crushed by the anxiety that they've you know held at the door. So I think it's the I think it's the feeling after you have made it. So, so what do you think paralyzes people? I know far too many people, Kapil, who are paralyzed to make decisions in their lives. And one of the most important decisions is, to, is what you and I have been talking about for several years, to make this commitment to go on this uncompromising journey to the truth. So whether it's personally or professionally or relationally, the, there's an overwhelming majority of people who aren't willing to make tough decisions or important decisions in their lives. So what's the question? Is it fear? Um, Certainly some are it's the fear of being wrong, especially in business. The fear of not wanting to see the truth as opposed to following the road of prescription? Is that yeah, what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, human beings are conditioned. So I think it's, I'm not sure it's correct to believe that they really have a choice between following the truth or being, or, or following their programming and conditioning to seek prescriptions. They're not, they're not, you know, sitting in a vacuum in which they can truly go either way. The, the, the pull and the gravity of the conditioning is too great, which means that the pull and the gravity of, of seeking the truth as a result of either become, having become um, uh, tired, uh, have, of having wasted their lives with prescriptions, or by uh, a a genuine desire to seek the truth, either one will work. But no one's really sitting in neutrality, uh, having to make an intellectual decision as to whether they will seek the path of prescription or truth. What's the role of intuition in your life? I think the difficulty is deciphering between conditioned intuition and natural intuition. Hmm. Um, uh, you know, and don't ask me how. Uh, it, it, it's, I've, listen, it, it, I've learned it, my it, lesson. Yeah, there, it's, I think that question is the greatest how there is in this particular context. Um, the very fact of knowing that the intuition that's coming up, is that arising from conditioning and programming 
of having lived in a society? Is it a, is it a reflex behavior? Or is it true? I think that question has to be genuinely asked, not verbally and not, not mechanically and not prescriptively. That question has to be explored, knowing that, that intuition isn't just intuition. And when do you know you're, you, you're getting a glimpse of the truth for you personally? Um, when, it, when it isn't a reaction to something. Hmm. And, and when it isn't a, um, a play for something. When there can be no other choice. Totally you. All right, I want to ask you two more things, and these are requested questions uh, from people who listen to us often. A leader wants to know um, is, do you have a preferred method at setting organizational goals from the perspective of understanding that um, weak goals, meaning goals that are just incremental growth, are lead to complacency, impossible goals in her eyes are difficult to get people inspired around. So where is that sweet spot so we can get an organization to rally around something that, that it hasn't done before? Yeah, there's no rallying, okay, first of all. Everything's got to be doing done with one person, the leader. There's no rallying. There's no pep rally. There's no, there's no collective. There's no group. All the, those ideas have to be completely, you know, jettisoned. Um, in asking that question, whatever leader that you're speaking of who asked that question, uh, it should be known that this leader is placing a massive and enormous ceiling upon him or herself in asking that question. No matter what answer that they possibly could receive, uh, the very question is a dead end. So how, how are the teams inspired? Vision? There's no team. There's no team, Mo. The, the, it, listen, if you have 10 people in a room, let's be honest. I'm not here for diplomacy, right? We're here to tell the truth. We're here to speak the truth. I'm not, I'm not here to... Make friends and make everyone happy. They just speak to speak the truth. If you have a group of ten, if you have one in those ten who is a unique, rare DNA, outside the box human, he needs to run like hell from the other nine. Because I can guarantee you, in a group of ten, you're not going to have that one. And if by some miracle you do, you're not going to have two. So that one is going to be swallowed by the nine. So that one needs to forget about motivating anyone or rallying anything. That one needs to become so world class at, lear at arriving at purity, at arriving at internal wholeness, at arriving at making perfect decisions, at, arri at arriving at crystallizing his or her vision without any interference, feedback, questioning, or pollution by any of the other nine. And this is not going to be written in any book. And this is not going to be presented that, in that PowerPoint we know lectures for sure, conferences. Right? Yeah, that we know right? for sure. So no one's going to discuss these things because, because it's, it's, it's too stark. Okay? It's the absolute truth. There are not that many rare DNA human beings in the world. And the ones that there are, and there are, there are several. Five, to be okay. exact. Well, whatever there are. <laughs> Maybe six this week. <laughs> they're never in the same, they're never in the same group. Never. So wherever they are all around the world, um, they need to allow themselves the permission to be unabashedly who they are. 
because they are like the sand that is being lapped by the ocean of the common who was wearing away their foundation. So if I'm if I am this individual running this company and I know that hey one out of the 10 or 5 out of the 50 or 100 out of the 5000 well, well that leader has to be that one, you know? That leader has to be that one. What the hell do that I do leader, with the other 4500? You know, when the one is completely the one, people fall in line. That's the way it usually works. Mm -hmm. If you open a door of kumbaya, all you're going to get is filth. And all you're going to get is interference and noise. And all you're going to get is putting massive ceilings on a company that could have been great if it had been run by way of, uh, you know, a, a single leader as opposed to, you know, give me feedback. It's such a, it's such just nonsense. It's conditioning, it's me, right? It's conditioning. Give me, feed, you know, give me feedback as to how you think I, I mean, like I told you in the last podcast, you know, Rembrandt doesn't ask for feedback. Right. And if you're one, not, that was one of my favorite lines, right? Yeah. And if, and if you're not a Rembrandt, then realize that, right? But, you know, but you have to ask real questions. You cannot, you cannot go to business conferences and meet with common people in the business community and discuss these business ideas and these leadership ideas and these methods and techniques and five ways to lead and and be kind to your employees and don't say that and don't fire them and <laughs> fire this one but don't fire that one and make sure i mean what do you, what do you think this is i mean just people are not serious they're just not serious they're juvenile yeah, well, and then, and then, you know, they know that uh, you are certainly one of a kind. So here's my last question to you. Uh, one of the things that, um, that I really have tremendous respect that I've gained from you about approaching life is to have these non-negotiables or uncompromising, you know, ways that I want to lead my life. But the whole idea of not really caring about what others think is really almost liberating so when i think about people living like that is that kind of a glimpse of what freedom looks like for people who really truly live that way i think that's a massive milestone to arrive at not caring what anyone thinks about you not even your own family not even your own kids not your spouse, not your boss. And if you're famous, not your followers, not your audience, not your fans, not the media. Uh, to, to not reactively, but to genuinely arrive in that place inside yourself um, because you have really explored who you are and who you are not and the things that you have pretended to be and owned up to pretending to be them inside yourself um, and and in 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 removing all of those facades within you to where you arrive at this enormous calm because you no longer have to put on a face um, that's an enormous milestone in a human being's life.